certain procedures and complications. Now, when you come to the anatomies, just let's start with the surface anatomy first. So in the surface anatomy, basically, uh, when you're starting an arthroscopy, so this is the patient who uh, is in lateral decuper disposition. So we can actually see the olecranon, the lateral epicondyle, the radial head, the medial epicondyle, and then, and, and then the ulnar nerve has been marked as well. And that's very important because when you start doing an arthroscopy, so before the start of arthroscopy, you should measure all these bony prominences. Now this is the anatomy on the left and the medial side. So this is this. So this will be your. Uh, so on the top will be your. I can't find where my pointer is. So we've got the humerus, the ulna, and uh, then we've got the the radial, the median nerve, which is a. Um, Sorry, the ulna nerve, which is passing very closely here. So this will be a medial epicondyle. And then we've got the, the medial, to, uh, medial to tennis nerves. And here we've got the median nerve. And this is the brachial artery. And somewhere here will be the medial intramuscular septum, which is very important, especially if you're putting the proximal intramedial portal. On the lateral side, we have, the, we have other structures as well. So we've got the medial epicondyle, so we've got the radial head. Passing near it, then we've got the, the radial nerve, and then it divides into uh, its branches. And then we've got lateral anti antibrachial cutaneous nerve, which goes like this. And somewhere here is what we call the direct lateral approach or, or the soft area. Now, so before we, we start on elbow arthroscopy, in which we put the patient in, we have to, we have to mark all the bony prominences. Indications, indications are gradually increasing and with the increasing uh, expertise, people are doing things which they could only dream of a few years back, but you need to use for loose body removal, osteophyte debridements, and vectomies, osteochondritis, desiccans, uh, tennis elbow debridement, you can also fix fractures as well, and you can do a capsule release and capsule autonomy as well. Now, when we prepare uh, these patients, obviously, majority of these patients, you can, uh, you can do it under GA. You have to apply a tonic, and before you start with the procedure, you have to do an EUA to assess this, especially if you're dealing with a case which you think may be unstable. Instruments. Um, for the interior compartment, you can use the standard four millimeter, 30 degrees angle arthroscope. And for the postrolateral and the posterior compartment, because of the paucity of space, you can use a 2.7 meter, 30 degree scope. I personally use a 2.7 meter, 30 degree scope for both interior and the posterior compartment. Uh, you, uh, you need special hooks, curates, pointed curates, uh, and, and we need these instruments just because of the reason, because the space uh, is of a premium. In so we have to have, and these are, these are not sort of very complicated, so it's quite simple instruments. But they make your life quite easy. And of course, you need a, a shaver, uh, a small shaver uh, for your, uh, if you want to do any shaving. Positioning, uh, there are three positions that are commonly used. So one is the, uh, the prone position, the lateral capitis position, which is my favorite, and the supine position. And the supine position, again, you can either have it with the, with the arm, arm sort of uh, in a strip on a support or over the elbow joint. Um, depends upon uh, the, the surgeon preference, whichever approach they want to use. All of them have got their advantages and disadvantages. The prone position, obviously, you get a better access to the posterior portal, and you don't need any arm support. But a patient, a putting patient prone, you are basically having a more difficult anesthesia. If you want to convert into an open procedure, then it it, it may be a problem. In arthroscopy, you get a better anterior access, easier anesthesia, easier conversion to to open. Sorry, we've lost your internet cover. You mean? Yeah. So,
So while we're waiting for Zaid Saab to join us, how, Tariq, you do Alba arthroscopies? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I used to do quite a lot. And, and at one stage I was doing all my tennis elbows with it also, but now because of the shoulders taking away quite a lot, I've left will to do them, most of them, but I, I, I still do the odd, you know, frozen show, fro, you know, the, the elbow releases. I mean, the only thing I find is that um, although we've got, you, we, we've got the dedicated elbow and scopes, I often find it difficult. I, I, I may start off with a small scope, but then I usually, unless the patient's very small, go up to my normal scope. Um, and I find actually that, that that's okay as long as you know where you are um, and gives you a much better field of vision. Yeah, I do the same. I also use the four millimeter uh, scope and I, I don't go to the small one at all. Yeah. Okay. The only catch here, we can't hear you, Sufyan, also. You must do something with your mic. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, uh, much better. Yeah. Uh, so the thing is that uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, elbow traumas uh, around here and the shattered elbow fractures usually end up in having a very stiff sort of an elbow with limited uh, range of motion and mostly the thing which actually troubles them is uh, the inability to flex over 90 degrees and in a, with, with at least a 5 to 10 degrees of extension lag into their elbow. So is there any indication of uh, going in and, and in an elbow using it, you're taking your arthroscope inside them post fixation of your, uh, your, your elbow, uh, post reconstruction of your elbow? Do you have any experience of uh, regarding this sort of situation? So I don't know if Tarek will tell you, but once, once they, they break and the capsule tears, there's no way you can put fluid them and distend them. I don't know how people manage to do fractures with arthroscopes. It's, you're, really at the, you're really stretching the indications. And it's the sort of thing that unless you're doing it really regularly and you're, you know, this is your main area of work, you should not really even consider. I would just stick to the different open approaches to try to debride the joint and get rid of any, um, any, any, any bits of bone that may be blocking the movement as well. Um, so I wouldn't consider scope in that, Sofian. Yeah, I, I do the open lateral, go front and back and it helps me. But saying that, I'm not sure what you did. I have a scope, I have a special sheet for it because, you know, the sheets that I use for, for uh, a normal scope has got holes at the end of it to allow fluid into it. When I'm doing an elbow arthroscopy, I have a sheet which has got no holes in it because the capsule is so small that it normally leaks out. So I have a special sheet for my elbow scope, but I still use the four millimeter. For me, me let's go. Mm. Sir, which position do you prefer to have yeah, the I patient? Them I do them prone. Prone. I, I, yeah, I, because I've got TARDIS. TARDIS can look after anybody like me. He can put them to sleep and wake them up. So TARDIS is good. No, I, I do a lateral decubitus. Uh, yeah. It depends on your release, isn't it? And not, not on everything else. No, I've got a pretty good anaesthetist, but I just, um, I've got just used to doing it with the lateral decubitus. What's his name? I used to do it uh, from uh, Stanley from, from Sheffield. He used to do it with the decubitus. Yeah, I work with Stanley, you know, and, and he, he told me to whichever way you're comfortable. He did show me lateral decubitus, but when we arrived at, at the manor, uh, I think uh, I did not have a, you know, a positioner to put the elbow in. But now, uh, well, after about four or five years, they bought me one. By that stage, it was too late, and I'd gone to, to go into to prone. I didn't have a positioner. You know, the one that we put the elbow in? Mm. It's a half, half an arm, arm support. Not so we, we've lost side time, is it? Yeah, I think so. It's, the, it's, it's been banned. The, the, the internet service has been banned. So, sir, can we discuss something regarding the elbow joint? I mean, elbow joint uh, behaves a lot different than, I mean, knee and the hip and the shoulder joint. Uh, the upper limb joint tends to go in more into stiffness sort of phase as, as the problem is with shoulder that you actually get a condition of it is a capsulitis or a frozen shoulder. So happens with the elbow joint as well. Is there any specific reasons of the upper limb joints actually behaving much more abnormally than your lower limb joints? I mean, I have rarely seen a knee going into a different sort of a condition and returning back after a, a certain period of time. 
so the because elbow is, is i mean traditionally taught and that we have seen as well is considered as one of the most unforgiving joints of uh, the upper limb that uh, you actually cannot play a lot of it because of the anatomical variation on that so is there any specific reasons in uh, in undertaking in thinking of the indication before going for an arthroscope because it will definitely lead to irritation of the synovium around the elbow joint because i personally have no got no experience of doing an arthroscope yeah, i will answer that question or try to and tarik can join in when he feels or when he has more to offer so the first thing is when you have a hip and knee problem you walk and you mobilize it you have physio whether you like it or not you have to go to the toilet you have to go and feed yourself whereas in the shoulder elbow and even in the hand and wrist if there is a problem you don't do anything you just keep it in a sling plus the hand has this thing called uh, uh, hand shoulder syndrome where everything becomes stiff there is no etiology for it because we don't know yet that's one of the reason the second thing is the bone is very close uh, to the skin in especially in the elbow and the wrist there is not a lot of soft tissue cover as well as you have a lot more soft tissue cover around different other joints and thirdly uh, uh, arthroscopically you don't have problems post arthroscopy their capsule distend their capsules have function their capsules have uh, you know do play so actually the arthroscopy is far more useful in these joints to stop you from having long term problems rather than causing them but other than that i don't know any specific reason why they should go into such bad you know stiffness you're absolutely right the the the, the elbow particularly in, i mean shoulder maybe but the hand and elbow going to a lot of problems even if you do carpal tunnel you end up with crps in the hands correct um what sufyan uh, you're talking about is mainly the post traumatic ones aren't you in elbows uh yes mostly post traumatic exactly whereas if you look in the shoulder a lot more actually happened primarily as well and mm. the, the latest series seem to show that between 20 to 25% of diabetics will get a frozen shoulder at some point and it's between 3 to 5% although it keeps changing in the non diabetic population and i've often thought i think possibly possibly one of the if you if you ever go into a shoulder where it's uh very where there's some pain and doing an arthroscopy I've seen it a few times I took to a dry scope and you'll see there's an there's a huge amount of vasodilatation within the joint and that seems to be the first stage of adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder so I think what's happening and one of the and one of the problems that diabetics share I think with this problem is they get a neuropathy no it's a new I've spoken about this to neurophysiologists and we've talked about trying to set up a plan to look at this But I suspect what's happening in the diabetic adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder is that they get some form of sympathetic neuropathy from probably the suprascapular nerve or one of the branches, and that's what sets it up. And then through a feedback mechanism, the body tends to correct itself. Because the other odd thing about adhesive capsulitis is once you have it, you never get it again in the same shoulder, and and that, that's a truism which you know people talk about. So. coming with that i think possibly what's happening is we're getting some form of neuropathy which is then setting in course the events that lead to this massive thickening and then if you leave it long enough not i'm not talking about the post traumatic one now i'm talking about in the other ones it it seems to go away so i've often thought when i wonder whether things like gabapentin and stuff might have a role to play in the early stage to get them over the pain and keep them moving then as monover was saying when you when they stop moving then they become uh, and when it's too painful they stop moving and then it's a self fulfilling prophecy so it's it's an odd one yeah, but but I, i do agree there is a lot of role to play with with this if that like if we look at the chronic regional pain syndromes that you have in the in the people who just have carpal tunnel releases i think there's the same i think that is happening in the shoulder uh, sorry and and the elbow um, about 15 years ago i i did a talk to our physicians and I spoke to them about diabetes and frozen shoulder and they thought I'd come from a different planet and they said you know are you telling me that your frozen shoulders are related to diabetes it's no such thing but so things change people open minds people have a lot of things to say uh, but but yes this is an unsolved mystery um, you, you know my my um, view on elbow arthroscopy is it's safe uh, I don't know whether we will get a, i've just had a, t- a telephone or text from um that side of the city is trying to get in but well, i do try to look for the um, intramuscular septum uh, when i before i put my probe in and and once i've seen where the intramuscular septum is 
and I go in front of it and I know the nerve's not going to be damaged. And before I do anything, I actually use the triangular area on the lateral side and inflate it. Like I said, I use a special sheet which has got very, no holes in it, so I'm no, I'm, I'm, but you must know your indications. You can do a diagnostic, you can take loose bodies out. You can certainly do a tennis. I mean, if I knew, I would have put some pictures in. I've got some pictures for ECRB. I think one of that papers got accepted somewhere a long time ago that we did an arthroscopic series about 50 odd with maybe the tennis elbow releases. But you, you must know your indications. You know, uh, in a fracture situation, I have got no experience and I would not recommend people to stick in cameras because I've done that in the past and all I saw was blood. <laughs> I'm not sure if I can recommend that. However, uh, uh, the only thing that comes with experience is is the um, the adhesive uh, uh, or, or the, the stiff elbows. And I, I I now do an open release purely because uh, I can't be bothered. That's the answer to it because it takes too long to do it arthroscopically. You have to descend it sequentially and try to see what you. But the lateral column procedure is a lot simpler. I think I posted a book yesterday. On the the, um, the you know the sports forum back uh, mini mini open or mini invasive procedures. It's a very good book to read. It's got a lot of things to tell you, especially in small joints like elbows and hands and stuff like that. Arthroscopy is a great thing, but but you need to still have your skills. I remember working for a chap. Birmingham, I'm sure Tariq, you know him. Um, uh, uh, he was a big guy, uh, 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 Mr. Chana. Do you remember Chana? A good day, Chana. Yeah. Yeah, so he used to say, I do it because I can. I don't think so. In the current age, we can do things by saying it because he used to do the MTP arthroscopy. Do you remember that? He used to do colectomies and yeah, things yeah. like that, yeah. And he used to tell me, I do it whenever because I can. And, and I don't think so. I can make that statement, although it is an amazing statement and shows uh, <laughs> yeah, how, how, yeah. yeah. It has to be built for, so, isn't it? Yeah, I know. Uh, what is the optimal uh, fluid pressure that you keep in an elbow? So I have a I have a, a pump, and all my pumps for for my hips is seventy millimeters flow and pressure, for my shoulder is fifty millimeters pressure and and, and flow, and for my elbows uh, it's also fifty millimeters of pressure and fifty millimeters fifty millimeters um, of flow. So, uh, so the only thing uh, I change I mean, is the hip where it becomes seventy. Everything else is fifty. With the, with the uh, elbow, I tend to use 35 to 40. Uh, excuse me, sir? Yes. Sir, uh, when we get a patient with post-traumatic uh, stiffness of the elbow joint, yes. it often becomes difficult to treat that. So can you guide us how we can address this stiffness? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I get a very intensive physiotherapist to work with them. I have my own team here, which is a, a blessing. Um, I have my own physio attached to me in my practical clinic also. These patients have aggressive physio. If they don't work, then I do what is called a lateral column procedure. Um, it, it, it is an amazing procedure. It allows you to go on the front and the back of the elbow, and I'd actually take the whole capsule out. It takes about half an hour to do it, but, but once I've done it, they don't go home. They have physiotherapy straight away after surgery because TARDIS puts them in the block, so they get full range of motion before they're allowed to leave. However, there was a paper written okay. by uh, uh, David Stanley from, 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 from Sheffield, and he said that they lose about 15 degrees of correction that you achieve from the table. So it, it is not forgiving, as everybody says, but it is far better than having a stiff elbow. Make sure that we have a CT and an X-ray that there is no bony component to the stiffness. If it's only a stiff shoot, because the blood from, from the trauma it goes into the capsule and changes the organization of the capsule and therefore it becomes difficult. Cousin Saab, where are you moving? You, you are... Hello, sir. Greeting. Uh, yeah, sir, Malaysia. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sir, Malaysia. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, greeting from Lumpur, Malaysia. I am right now in the airport. Uh, I have uh, to fly back uh, to Karachi, hopefully at uh, two hours uh, from here. So, uh, I was just listening. I just uh, uh, joined late. So, uh, I was listening about uh, uh, this uh, conversation uh, going on. Uh, my query uh, about uh, the elbow, my, this one thing, any uh, reason why there is um, high chances of myositis ossification in patient with elbow uh, as compared to the other joint, like shoulder is also a joint, elbow is also a joint. 
why there's a more chances of myocarditis also began as compared to the other any specific reason behind it or anything uh, uh, special in the elbow joint that's not present in the other joints so it's a very interesting question i, I was in a recent meeting one of the uh, um one of the guys was promoted from, from, from colonel to brigadier, and he says when he became a brigadier, he was said that he can't curse. And if somebody asks a difficult <laughs> question, you say it's an interesting question. Like, <laughs> 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 yeah, but, but the reason why it's not myositis as if it can is because myositis as if it can does not behave or play under any rules. However, we were just discussing before you joined us that Sufyan asked, well, why do this more stiff? I think the elbow is a special joint. It has got a lot of things that doesn't follow any rules. And I think that is one of the reasons why it has higher incidence of myositis as well. Probably because you can actually see it. And therefore, you investigate it and then therefore you know it is there. If it was somewhere else, you may not see it or not feel it. And therefore, you wouldn't know it was there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you very started? much, sir. Sorry? Is there any, any, I, mean, oh, sorry? Sorry? I can't hear Tariq. Tariq has gone to sleep. No, I can hear you. Yeah. No, no. So he's asking why elbows got more myocytes or significance compared to the rest of the body. Um, is, is that right? And that was uh, the cousin's what question. Is, is, it, is it that the calcification is more vis visible and more apparent in that joint? I think that's what, what I thought so. Because it is visible, it's more apparent, therefore we know about it. Other than that, it is as common as anywhere else, like isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the, you've got this uh, very flat muscle, the brachialis, and all that uh, adherent to the capsule, which probably get, makes it more prone, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. So while we're waiting, uh, while we're waiting, I will see if we can start a bit on wrist arthroscopy because apparently Will is stuck in a train and he can't join us yet. Uh, so let, let's do, I've got a very quick presentation on wrist arthroscopy, very quick presentation. Okay. See if we can have a look at it. <coughs> okay, so basically, um, well, this is how I do wrist arthroscopy. It may not be the only way to do it, but it is how I do it. And, I do, and, and, and the, the problem I have is, is that I'm giving up a lot more stuff than I thought I was going to. I'm, I'm now uh, concentrating more and more on shoulders. Uh, for whatever reason, it is getting into my practice that I do a lot more arthroplasties and a lot more shoulder work rather than anything else. But uh, um, I have a, I put the patient uh, uh, lying down. Uh, I have uh, the finger Chinese finger traps uh, that I put the patient on. Uh, and I, I use something really special. You know, this is my elbow arthroscopy uh, tra tray, which is a short arm splint. I put it upside down. The, uh, the elbow, it's on the tonic. Uh, uh, and then I put the finger traps. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I can't show you the pictures here because I did try to see if I had some of my... Uh, but what I do is I take these two finger traps and then I uh, use it... Uh, uh, I attach it to a rope, and the rope is then attached to the old sponge forceps. You know, the, and they're both on one side of the sponge forcep, and the sponge forcep then goes onto the drip stand. So this is what my traction system is. And the more I lift the drip stand, the more there is a uh, uh, tension on the wrist. Then I find the uh, dorsal tubercle on the radius, uh, which is called the listus tubercle, and I just go, go above it, and pointing downwards, facing towards the roller surface, I inflate it. And the amazing thing is, if you are in the joint, the whole wrist becomes extended. If you're not in the joint, the whole fingers and the dorsum becomes uh, filled up with fluid. So that's an easy, simple thing that I see. I just press in uh, and see the finger or the wrist extending. Okay. Once I've done that, I make a small cut, uh, and the cut is in the third compartment. And then I use, a, if you can see, a needle or, or a small mosquito to go up to the capsule, but not through the capsule, because if I do, the fluid will come out and I won't be able to put it in it. And that's to get the superficial nerves. I then go above the dorsum of the wrist uh, in, a, in a sort of a downward direction. Uh, and once the fluid comes back, I know I'm in the right place. Uh, and then I connect my uh, uh, scope. So this is slightly different scope than, than what I normally use. The reason for that is I don't have a sheet with no holes in it in the normal modern scope. So this is an old fashioned scope where it comes in two parts. There is a trocar that goes in and then this sheet connects it to the top with fluid and the camera being attached to it. The camera is still the new thing is the trocar canal is old. The reason for that is 
I don't like holes at the end of it when I'm doing wrist arthroscopy also because it leaks everywhere, okay? So this, these, these are special things. It still is a normal, sorry, I, I do use a small scope here. I, I wasn't true. I do use a small uh, scope, the 2.7 2 millimeter scope, okay? And it's a 30 degree scope. I have small shavers also for these. This is me doing a, 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 a release uh, uh, for, for, um, for a procedure that I did a little while ago. But my indication now for wrist arthroscopy is very simple. I do see uh, them to classify and grade the scaphal lunate if I'm not sure. I looked at AVN of the lunate, such as Kindbox, and I, uh, most of my practice now is the TFCC debridement, tear or repairs. That, that is it. I don't do much arthroscopy, anything beyond that. I'm not sure what Tariq does or what his indications are, but uh, I do TFCCs and just diagnostic person. I think it's getting more and more limited purely because um, I don't see any use for it. I'm not very good at it, and I've got a lot more other things to do also. So anyway, so these are pictures from inside. I'll show you a video. You'll see it. This is the radial starlight. Then this is a scaphal lunate fossa. It's called the baby's button that you can see. And then from the TFCC portal, which is the the, uh, the sixth radial, so the sixth compartment on the radial side, I stick in, and you can see the TFCC very clearly in these pictures here. Uh, you can see the scaphoid. You can see the scaphoid lunate joint, that's what it looks like, okay? That's, so sorry, that was a scaphoid fossa on the ra uh, radius side here. Yeah? Uh, and then you can uh, see, uh, uh, if you just pull the scope back, you can also come out and go back into the mid carpal joint, which is slightly above, exactly the same portal, but slightly above it. And you can see all the, 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 the mid carpal joint. I think I've got a small video. Uh, this is the... Uh, 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 scaphoid and you can see the radial fossa as you come in this is the radial lunate fossa you can see the lunate at the top and as you come around as you come out there's a big huge bubble that's stopping you from seeing it but you can then go into the lunate side where you look at the TFCC okay so this is uh, me coming in uh, from the sixth uh, R portal with a needle to tell me where I am this this TFCC does not look normal to me so uh, I don't do much with these. I just clean it up. There's a central and peripheral tear. Peripheral I repair, central is degenerate, so I tidy it up. This looks central to me. And I just clean it up or with the portal. Uh, I actually wrote up this. Uh, what I do is I put a, a 1.6 millimeter K wire into the portal I want to go. And then I, I, I use the, um, you know, I dismantle the sheet of the uh, shaver and I put the sheet in first, and once I put the sheet in, I take the needle out, and then I put the shaver with it so I can use it, so it keep, makes me keep having the bottle. I wasn't hoping to present this today. I thought um, Will was going to do it, but it's a short presentation that I had somewhere, and I've just used it, yeah. Question time. Uh, Mr. Shah, what is the size of shaver that you use? What is this? It's a, it comes in a very small size. It is a 1.7. 1.7. Yeah. And the ablator is what? Uh, the ablator, you same also size. use a smaller size? Ablator is the same size. Okay. But, but I mean, I've stopped doing a lot of things. You know, I only do it now for the TFCC test. Very rarely, if I'm not 100% sure, or as Tariq would say, they come to see us on, across the road in the dark side, then I would like to do a diagnostic arthroscopy. Yeah? Um, yeah, no, like yourself, I mean, I, I do little in the way of, we've got some hand surgeons in the trust, so I leave all the stuff for them, but I do, I've done diagnostics, I do the TFCC, but um, I would say I'm an upper limb surgeon starting from the shoulder working down. There are other upper limb surgeons who start from the hand working up, so, you know, the wrist, the wrist starts becoming more mysterious. Yeah, I mean, in our, in our hospital, we don't have a hand surgeon. So Will, Will does all the wrist and elbow stuff, arthroscopic stuff, and yeah. I do the shoulder work, but he also does the shoulder work. So I'm the surgeon that starts from up down. Apparently, he can be the surgeon. He actually does a lot more shoulders also, so, but he does the wrist arthroscopies. And we were having a chat uh, before this meeting. He said we should sit down and, and one of us should take it all so that he has the numbers. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Yeah, no, we've, got, we've got two hand surgeons. So, uh, I, uh, we can't hear you, Tariq. No, I said we've got two hand surgeons yes, and then yeah. we've got the yeah, Chelsea. We're done. We're done. Oh, okay. So Zaid Saab has joined us. Do you want to continue from where you left? Sir. 
Yeah, shall I or? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. All right. Sorry for that. <laughs> So, to which point did you hear me? So, when you were telling us, keep going, uh, keep going to, to keep well, going down. Sorry, this is the. Yeah, if you if you keep going down with your slides. So we were on the um, fifth. Yeah, that, that's the slide. The last slide we saw. Right. <clears throat> sorry. Right. So. So the, the portal are concerned, portal are basically divided into three, uh, three sort of categories, the lateral portals, the medial and the, and the posterior portals. And uh, then you've got the, and they're basically all the distal anterolateral portals, the medial anterolateral portal, and, uh, and the proximal anterolateral portal, and the same goes for the medial side. The posterior are the direct posterior, the posterolateral, and the direct lateral portals. Uh, so the three lateral portals, we've got the standard portal, or the, uh, also known as the distal anterolateral portals, the middle anterolateral portal, and the proximal anterolateral portal. Um, now the, one, the, the one which is commonly used in elbow arthroscopy is the middle anterolateral portal. And you can actually see it's about 9.8 millimeter from the radial nerve. As you, as you go proximally, uh, you, 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 you are further away from the radial nerve. So the proximal anterolateral portal uh, is, is probably a bit further from the radial nerve as compared to the middle one, but the middle one is commonly used because with the proximal, you tend to get a more oblique entry into the elbow joint. The, the distal anterolateral portal uh, is about three centimeter distal and one centimeter anterior to the, uh, to the lateral condyle. And you can actually see you are quite near to the uh, to the, the radial nerve, uh, where the medial, the, the middle anterolateral portal is basically just interior to the radial capital joint. So if you feel the radial capital joint, it's just in front of it, while the, while the proximal anterolateral portal is uh, about 1.2 centimeter proximal and one centimeter interior to the lateral epicondyle. Here you, you get all the marks. So this would be a standard anterolateral portal. This is your anterolateral portal. And this is this being marked. So the middle anterolateral portal is just in front of your radial capital joint. The medial again, they are the distal, middle, and the proximal one. Uh, anterolate, the anteromedial portal or the distal anteromedial portal is two centimeter interior and two centimeter distal to the middle epicondyle. But uh, when it comes to the medial side, the one which is commonly used is basically the proximal anteromedial portal, which is about two centimeter proximal to the medial pudal and just in front of the of the medial border of the uh, middle border of the humerus, on which you have the attachment of the medial intermuscular septum. Now, the proximal portal is again the one which a lot of for a lot of the people will be the first portal they will make. And through this, you will be able to draw the whole of the interior compartment, the radial head, the capitulum. And if we draw it backwards, then you should be able to see the, the coronoid trochlea uh, and, and, and one of the medial portals. This is the one which is most commonly used. So this would be your standard one, and this is the proximal. Uh, the the mid-interior one or the middle one is commonly not used because it's so near to, uh, to, to both these portals. So this is just the lane marks. Uh, the proximal anteromedial portal is basically feel the epicondyle and just go along the, epi, um, along the epicondyle, about two centimeters proximal, and just in front of the medial part of the humerus, uh, you make uh, you make this portal. The posterior portals are the direct posterior portal, posterior lateral portals, um, and the direct lateral portals. So uh, the distal portal, the distal the direct posterior portal is uh, basically two finger beds above the tip of the electron. Basically, go through the tricep. Posterolateral is again roughly in the same line, but on the lateral side of the of, of the tricep. The direct lateral portal is basically the it's a soft soft portal, which is basically in the in a triangle formed by olecranon, the radial head, and epicondyle. And this is the soft spot. Basically, you feel and you inject uh, uh, inject your saline 
basically to inflate the joint. There is a third portal, which is some people use, which would be the distal ulnar portal, which is basically on the lateral side of the ulna, roughly about three to four centimeters from the joint line. And you have to go quite obliquely on that. Uh, and this one, people will really use it for, uh, um, for when there are some ost osteochondritis disease. So here will be your direct posterior portal. The posterior lateral portal can be anywhere from here to here, but generally it is made just in line with the direct posterior portal. And this will be your direct lateral portal, and this is the direct, the distal ulnar portal. Now the portal, so we've got so many portals, but the portal which is commonly used on the posterior side would be the direct posterior portal and the posterior lateral portal. On the middle side is the proximal anteromedial portal, and on the lateral side will be the mid anterolateral portal. And uh, the proximal uh, anterolateral portal gives you good visualization of the anterior and the humeral joint or the capital joint. If you want to go through the post posterior soft spot, you, can, you should be able to see the posterior surface of the radial head, posterior capitulum, and the radial surface of the olecranon. The proximal probably gives you the most panoramic view of the whole of the interior part of the elbow joint, while the posterior lateral portal and the direct posterior portal will give you good access to especially the Urkunon process, Urkunon fossa, uh, and the posterior and uh, So this is, a, uh, this is a short video. So actually the first what you've done is, is making the mark. So this will be the Urkunon, the middle side, the middle epicondyle. Uh, so we've got Alana here. Um, and then if you feel, if you feel, just in front of the middle condyle, if you jog, just go approximately about one to two centimeters or two finger breaths go just in front of the intramuscular septum, middle muscular septum, you will have the proximal intramuscular portal. You have to realize that with this portal, you are roughly about three to four millimeter from the uh, from the ulnar nerve. Uh, so about. And, it, and you can actually feel the lateral epicondyle as well, so you can mark the lateral epicondyle here. And just in that safe spot, especially if um, you move right and supinate your forearm, you should be able to feel the radial head. And this is sort of the soft spot where we really have the direct posterior, sorry, direct lateral portal. Uh, just in front of the radial capital joint, somewhere here, you will have a you will have your uh, mid intro lateral portal and roughly from some, maybe about nine, uh, seven to eight millimeter from here, you will have your, you will have your radial nerve. Uh, on the posterior side, about two finger beds uh, from the tip of the recron, you will have uh, your direct posterior portal and the entry into the joint will be sort of oblique. And if you draw your, if you feel the tricep, uh, just on the side of the lateral side of the tricep, you will have your um, uh, uh, postural portal. Uh, so this is basically a, a view from the proximal anteromedial portal. So you're you're seeing the epithelium, the radial head, and if you want to see the 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 coronary process on the, the interior part of the uh, middle part of the humerus. So you can actually see the radial head sort of rotating and revolving around. So you can actually see if there is any, any problem there. And as you, uh, any portal after your first portal, you, you, it's advisable to make it with the help of a needle. So, so this is, I think he's trying to make the, into little portal with the help of needle, and then you can make a make a small nick here. Posterior part um, you can actually uh, do with the direct posterior approach. So actually, the direct posterior approach basically use it uh, sort of your main portal, and the direct and and the posterior lateral portal you you use it as your uh, as your working portal if you want to work on the posterior side. So here you can actually see a, 
a loose body being taken off of the posterior compartment of the elbow joint. So these are some of the conditions you can treat. So this is patient with an osper, um, with the astro, uh, with the PVNS. So you can actually see on the other side. Uh, here we've got a patient who had a radial headache syndrome done arthroscopically. Uh, Removal of a loose body from the posterior part of the elbow joint, and uh, one of the one the common procedure with arthroscopy, a tennis elbow release being done as well. Uh, and again, if you if you go sort of more um, more experienced, then you can actually fix uh, fix flexures. In this uh, in this picture, you can actually see flexure of the coronary process has uh, been uh, has been fixed arthroscopically. Again, everything depends upon the level of experience, and you basically should start from the simple things like diagnostic arthroscopy, maybe loose body removal, debridement of an OCD or plaque excision, and you generally go to more advanced stages like a synovectomy, capsulectomy, and then you go to more experience, more stages like a fracture fixation. And I must tell you again and again that the learning curve for an elbow arthroscopy is quite steep, and basically you should stick the basics for things first and then to just gradually move on to the more advanced things. It's always important to have proper positioning of the patient and you should always identify and label all the landmarks, just make it a habit as, in, as is done mainly in the, in the shoulder arthroscopies. And the photos you make, you should take into consideration your intraarticular pathology and you should try to make the fewest number of photos which are required. And you should always, at the back of your mind, know where the radial nerve, ulnar nerve, and median nerves are. Uh, you should always be aware of the prior surgical intervention, especially if the patient underwent an interior ulnar nerve transposition. And some people will advise against doing an arthroscopy in these cases, uh, especially if you're applying too much pressure. If the procedure goes on for too long, then there can be excessive swelling and fluid stabilization. And you should always remember that each additional portal basically increases the risk of complications. And because of the location of the alunum, actually there's no safe uh, zone on the medial side, especially if you're using even the, uh, even the proximal intromedial portal, which is the, the portal which is most commonly used. You're, you're only about four to five millimeters from the alunum nerve. Uh, and you should try and, and you should try to place your portals as far away from the critical neurovascular structures, one. And second, you should try not to put your portals too close together because then you won't be able to work. So in a nutshell, elbow arthroscopy is a difficult procedure and there is a very steep learning curve. But as you become more experienced, you tend to do uh, more things. But again, you should stick to doing the easier procedures first um, and always stay on the safe side. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> We're not sleeping, huh? <laughs> no. So, um, Tarek, do you want to comment before I say something? No, very good. Excellent. Uh, Excellent presentation, yeah. Uh, very clearly outlining all the different portals and uh, as an introductory. Thank you very much. Thanks. So, so there's a few few learning curves and tips for everybody who wants to do it. Like like Zaitsab said, it's got a steep learning curve, but you must stick to basic principles. So although all these portals are very nice, I don't use all of them portals. The first portal I actually do is 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 the the uh, medial portal, and where I do is as as Zaitsab showed to you, I look for the intermuscular septum, two centimeters above and two centimeters lateral from from apicondal, and I make a portal. And, and I actually inflated before I make a portal into the safe zone on the lateral side. I touch the humerus anteriorly and then glide along it to go into the capsule. You can feel the pop and fluid comes out of it. I don't make any more portals from outside in. I then do portals through the joint. So when I'm doing a lateral portal, you can see ECRB on the right side and just above the radial head. I will push my camera onto that point and then I'll make an inside out portal. Uh, and that's about it. I will occasionally make a posterior portal through the triceps, but these are the three working portals I have. I do most things with these three portals. I have, like I said, stopped doing them, but for most of these portals, I, 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 uh, I have used them and I didn't find anything that was beyond them. Uh, just to say that, um, I do do the radial head excisions, but only, only after six weeks of trauma, purely because I don't know whether the interosseous membrane is intact or not. So 
what I will do with them is I will inject them with a local anesthetic and if they can prosuponate fully, I'll leave them alone. If they can't and there's a restriction of the block, then I want to fix the radial head and if I can't, I'll come back in six weeks time and excise it. But, but that's it, very nice presentation. Uh, I don't use all the portals. All the portals are very good to know, but stay away from them. Keep it simple, as they say, isn't it? Make your life easy for you. But very nice presentation, I'd say. Thanks. Anybody else want to ask a question? Sifian, Kazim is dying to ask a question. I can see it in your face, Kazim. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, First of all, very well presentation uh, by uh, Professor Zaid Askar Saab. Uh, sir, I have about this doing arthroscopy. Uh, yes, sound is not very good. Uh, what are the uh, say, uh, indication? Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, he's breaking up. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, now we can hear you. Huh? Yeah, yeah, much better. Yeah, better? Yeah, better. I think so. Okay. My what are the No, we can't hear you now anymore. I think your your pictures frozen on your internet is playing up. He's at the airport, isn't he? Yeah. Hmm. He's doing well to join us from the airport, you know, commitment. Yeah. <laughs> is this Colombo, Colombo, Sri Lanka, or Colombo, Malaysia? He says. I, I can't hear you. Sorry, yeah. No, is it Colombo, Sri Lanka, presumably? No, no, he's in Malaysia. Oh, okay. I thought he said Colombo. He, he's gone to the the sports center from I think Sanaullah is also there, and and there's some of the guys from they all want to present papers up there. Okay, very good. See, these guys don't even take holidays like you and me. They go and work, like, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Wife will kill me if I tell her we're not going on holidays this year, we're going to study an education like this. Yeah, try that one. <laughs> See how far you get. <laughs> you won't believe it. I've been given days that you can count in the fingers. These are the only days you can go and teach. You can't teach any more than that, and you can't do anything more than that. We, we've just had a thing present, uh, accepted for best now, so we have to go up to best. Oh, good. Well done. It's, it's, it's a bit of a mafia, the best thing. It is. Uh, it has changed since the old guard has passed off, like, isn't it? Yeah. Did, did I tell you the other day, apparently, we were in, in, in the Birmingham International Meeting, you know, that Socrates does. And yeah. um, we, the Americans have been sh 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 kind of really shook by the Andy Carr paper on, on uh, arthroscopic cervical decompression. So the insurance companies are not paying for it anymore. I can't understand how that small paper can change people's practices, isn't it? Yeah. Well, they're now calling it a decodication of the acromion. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I think I think we've had a good session. I'm sorry that Will couldn't join. He was in the in the in the um, uh, train. Uh, but saying that, uh, not a bad session. We have covered most of the joints now. Uh, either it's biologics next time or we go back to the top again and start doing various other soft tissue things. It's entirely with yourself. Just just let me know. Uh, oh, saying that, um, we have roped in um, uh, Ralph Rogers to come and present Sufjan's talk on, on Saturday in, in Karachi, isn't it? He seems to be very keen. You know, I'm not sure if there are any spies in the system, but apparently Matthew Wilson is taking in a big way and he wants to join in also to come to Pakistan market. Uh, and, and, and are you here, Kazim? Are you here, Kazim? No. Sufyan's here. So yes, Ali Nurani has corrections in Karachi. Uh, sorry, sir? Ali Nurani. You, you know your, your guy who's presenting on the soft tissue knees. Uh, um, Tariq was telling me he's got a lot of connections in Karachi. Uh, I think uh, he came once to Karachi. He went back, uh, last you know, his family lives in Karachi. Uh, yes, yes, he basically belongs to uh, some areas of interesting uh, sort of a uh, place. But uh, uh, for the time being, he's just visiting this place off and on. But uh, basically, Kazim has got the connection. Yeah, no, no, you talk about we need to have big guys with big names coming into Pakistan, which is always a good thing. So, right, our level, 
because uh, the thing that uh, even after the war that thing that started few uh, weeks back in pakistan we have to uh, i mean alhamdulillah a few good names uh, in this uh, uh, workshop and we are actually hoping to have a very interactive and a very i mean fruitful uh, session from 27th and so so on a personal level uh, sufyan have you found me a patient for a balloon uh yes there is one patient i he has got a painless full range of motion he has got a massive cuff tear uh he had a cervical fixation done he's still thinking about it i offered him a balloon uh and uh, he said that he will think about it and he'll, he'll come back to me so most likely okay. so uh, i am in the process and i'm hopefully going to bring about three balloons for you so then no, you, sure. you can use it in the future if you want to use it in the meeting but anyway i will call this meeting to an end it it, it was a very good session i saw absolutely fantastic presentation as usual i mean i i really enjoyed that sub talks it's very thorough it's very thorough unlike me i skip a lot of things and i only tell you what i want to tell you rather than what you need to know like you know <laughs> anyway call it a day i've got a video of it so hopefully i'll send it to all of you guys and i think we will discuss when i come to karachi we'll talk about whether we need to do from the beginning again to start from the top or should we do a as a, a you know the prp session or of balladics in between i just want to do balladics because that winds up uh, our karachi anyway like we like calls it snake poison <laughs> Okay thank you guys thank you for joining and hopefully see you soon bye bye